So let's give it up for Nancy and Sean. All right. Hey, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm Nancy Hall. I'm the CEO of Matterkind US. We are an addressable strategy and activation unit within IPG. So we run digital marketing programs for our brands that use data in biddable channels in order to drive outcomes. And I'm Sean Muzzy. I'm CEO for Canesso in North America. And Canesso develops technology solutions for all the IPG agencies and clients and actually does a lot of work with data and bringing that into um, helping develop audience strategies and a lot of what you're going to hear about today. So last night was tons of fun. Thank you, Philo. It was a great night. I know I met a lot of new people last night. I'm sure you all did too. So here's my question for you. Show of hands. Who loves networking? That's a wow. lot of people. That's a lot of people. Yeah. All right. Who finds networking challenging? So I'm surprised to see that more people love networking. But I would guess that even if you love it, you still find it challenging. And the reason is that it's hard. It's hard making connections with people. It's hard making connections with new people. This is something that we all have to do when we come to an event like this, but it's not easy. And it's not easy because in order to connect with people, we need to ask them questions, right? We need to ask questions and know something about them. We need to identify common denominators, like if we know somebody in common. And we need to uncover personal interests or activities, things that we can talk to people about. So let's give you a little bit of an example of how building connections and establishing trust could work. Hey, Sean. Hey, Nancy. Great to meet you. It's nice to meet you, too. What kind of things are you interested in? Let's see. I love music. Um, I'm actually like the most likely person to hijack a Wi-Fi speaker and take over the playlist. Cool, cool. Yeah. How about you? Do you what, are you watching any shows? What, what kind of? Yeah, I am. Yeah. So actually, I'm watching the newest season of Peaky Blinders at night, in bed, to wind down, on the TV. And then I'm watching House of Dragon in the gym. Gym. Okay. Yeah. So speaking of the gym, what do you do? You work out? Are you into health and wellness? Yeah, I, I absolutely am. I I'm always moving. I try to stay as active as possible. Um, in fact, a lot a lot of times, what I'll do is when I go into the city, I'll ride my bike to the train station, walk from Grand Central to the office. Oh, you guys, you guys are back in the office. We are. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually going to be in next week, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So we're going in quite a bit now. So it's awkward, right? It's awkward. It's hard. For me, the easiest thing to do is identifying that common denominator, like asking people, how do you know Jeff Ragavan? <laughs> this is like my new go-to networking thing. Everywhere I go, somebody knows Jeff Ragavan. So, and hey, that's a, nice that's to meet you. That's a blue fish, you. by the way, right, Jeff? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. You know Jeff Ragavan? I think it's a great opener, right? It makes things a little bit less awkward. Well, as marketers, you actually don't have that luxury, right? You can't in, in, engage face-to-face, -face, ask a lot of questions, and see people's reactions. But you, you actually have to build trust. You have to build those connections with consumers. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a really difficult thing to do, right? And what's making it even more difficult today is that... Next slide. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That is, we're in this changing media landscape. I think actually when you heard Christy and what she was talking about, about how it's harder to be precise and find people. We know about the changing privacy laws. There was actually, literally, I think I got three notices about what's happening in California over the last day or so. Um, we have to stay up with it as marketers. It's, you have to be agile and adaptive. And then obviously consumer behavior is changing. And that's actually why we're here, because we see, as, as, as Jeff was talking about, those progressive audiences and and that's something that we're able to actually actually look at. So even though with all that um, change that's happening in the ecosystem, there are strategies that we could use. Um, so we're going to take you through kind of an approach of how you could think about building a winning strategy. So to win, to, to deliver addressable programs that are scalable and that drive the outcomes that you want, you have to build connections by focusing on what matters most to people. And we can do that today. We can do that today because we have tools at our disposal within our industry, within our ecosystem, to uncover what matters most to people and then to message to them in a way that matters. 
So we have data that informs. We've got the ability to be digitally responsible, and this is really critical for all of us in this room. We're going to use data, we're going to message consumers, we have to be responsible about the way we do it, and we have to be respectful. Respectful of the consumers by employing conscious marketing. And then to drive the goals that we want for our programs, define and ultimately deliver our outcomes. So let's break this down. Let's start with data that informs. Obviously, data has to be informative. It should be unique. It's got to lead to better outcomes and better insights. So when we start thinking about data, we think about action-based data. You heard it a little bit about it in the two sessions right before us. What are, you, what are people interested in? What are they in market for? What are they past purchasers of? Where do they live? Where do they work? What kind of stores do they visit? And other behaviors. But you have to be able to identify the people correctly. So you have to know that Sean is into cooking. You have to know that the groups of people that you're messaging are who you think they are. Identity really matters. And the data, it needs to be scalable. It needs to be unique. It needs to be actionable. The data should be infused with new attributes and parameters about the people that you're messaging so that it's not the same data that everybody else is using. So that as consumers, when we receive messaging from that data, it's not the exact same as it is from every single brand. This is really critical, and these are really important points about using data and using data well. Speaking of using data well, we have to use data, media, and technology in a way that's digitally responsible. So what does that mean? Well, a whole lot of things. But it means that we use these data, technology, and media in a way that's positive, constructive, and ethical. And ethical is the key word there. When we think about data, we're talking about data for the next couple days, data should be ethically sourced. So what the heck does ethically sourced data mean? Well, first it means data that's procured in a way that's fair and responsible. It also means that the data that we use should be compiled from publicly available information. It should be uh, self-declared interests from consumers. And it should be data that companies are disclosing collection methods and use of methods to the ultimate consumers. And that can only be done by a company that is stable and reputable. But also, the data has to be compliant with laws. We suddenly have laws. This is a great, so Jeff talked a little bit about the cannabis laws earlier. But with data usage, as we all know, there are now laws that are governing and will govern the way we use data. So there are five states that have laws going into effect in 2023. California is only one of them. There are 32 states that have pending legislation. As companies, as marketers, as brands, we have to have the, the confidence in our data partners that this data is compliant with state laws. And then, of course, the data has to add value to all of the stakeholders. So for example, people like all of us or all of the people that are in our audience pools, the data has to add value to them. So for example, Sean should receive messaging about live music shows, concerts, because that's what he's interested in, not messaging about fabulous boots or great dresses like I would receive and like I would want to receive. And unfortunately, I do get ads for fabulous boots and, <laughs> and dresses. Um, and that's sort of part of the problem that we have to deal with right now. Because there's actually a lot of, we're going to talk about conscious marketing. There's a lot of unconscious marketing that's happening right now where um, obviously um, the likes of Google and all the other platform companies want to make it really easy for traders to go in and check boxes and get campaigns out. But the reality is that kind of mindless um, activity doesn't actually consider the consumer it doesn't, put, um, it doesn't help marketers really truly make that connection. Um, so building on what Nancy talked about, getting the right data, making sure you're digitally responsible, conscious marketing, it begins with empathy. So really thinking about the customer and the consumer and how you're gonna go about um, you know, making those connections. 
And then empathy leads to action. And, in, and this, all this is done in a very transparent way because ultimately as a marketer, you wanna make sure that the customers and people that you're targeting really value what you're bringing to them and, 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 and engaging in that kind of two-way conversation. Now, um, to dive in a little bit deeper into how you actually put conscious marketing into action, um, you know, there's inherent bias that exists within data and exists in a lot of the inventory and media partners we work with. And so it's really important to understand um, and make sure that the, the programs you're putting into market are representative of the true population. And actually, it's very relevant for why we're here today with Philo because as you saw from all that data that Jeff shared, um, a lot of these audiences we're targeting and the conversation that uh, Christy had with Jeff, um, that's now our representative population. And so how do we make sure marketing is getting into the right hands? We wanna ensure that we have a positive uh, experience for people, right? So Nancy talked a lot about, she brought up the example of me getting targeted with the wrong ads. How do we make sure that our frequency uh, is properly being managed so we're not over-delivering um, to certain audiences? And then I think a really um, undervalued thing is, you know, Nancy talked about an approach to ethically sourced data, digital responsibility. As, as the, our friends at Philo would know, we didn't just all of a sudden start running programs with Philo data. At IPG, we had to go through a very um, thorough process to actually vet at, at all the data and the systems where everything came from. It took about, I think, six, six months or so. Um, and that's the, that's the process we take with all of our partners. Uh, and that's how we actually can ensure that we're working with best in class data and technologies. And then the final thing is how do you ensure that all of your addressable media is as relevant as could be with the right messaging to the right audiences. So lastly, Nancy talked about how in order to actually deliver outcomes you know, and, and have winning campaigns, it really starts with those objectives. Right, and so you know, how are you setting clear and hard objectives? Um, you can build out the slide. There's various ways that people do it. You know, we heard about looking at things like ROAS and moving moving to sales, um, but we want to understand things like reach against certain uh, certain groups of people. We want to look for things like leading indicators. For some brands, store visits are leading indicators that could lead to a sale or a conversion. For other companies, actually, a store visit is that final conversion. And how efficient are we? You know, are we actually, um, you know, there's a, a big myth that data costs so much and it could actually build up your cost, but if you're, more, if you're performing better, it actually becomes more efficient. Um, so, and the final thing is, is how do we actually deliver against conversions and ultimately drive winning campaigns? So we talk about winning. We're running several winning programs today with Philo, as I'm sure several of you in the room are. And it's exciting. It's exciting because Philo is digitally responsible. It's exciting because Philo data is ethically sourced. It's exciting because the Philo data is new and different and infused with new attributes and parameters. So we're gonna take you through four cases. The cases are in the health vertical, two in retail and one in casual dining to show you ways in which we're employing data, digitally responsible, conscious marketing in order to deliver outcomes with Philo. So the first one, and I'm gonna look at the screen a little bit so that I can see some of the details, but the first one is a health case. The goal of this case was to compel people to order their prescriptions from an online pharmacy. So we worked with actually three different third-party data providers, Philo being one of them. We used Philo infused segments of health and CBD, online shopping, self-declared interest in hypertension, and we targeted in contextually relevant health-based media. Out of the three third-party segments that we ran with, the Philo data had the smallest segment and the CPM was the highest it was also the most effective. And that is the most important point here. First of all, from a results standpoint, the Philo data was 65% more likely to convert than the other data partners. But what I think is the most important point here is the reach rate, 20% better reach rate of the Philo data in the trade desk. So why is that so important? Well, when I talked about data before, I talked about identity. 
we have to know that the people in our audience segments are actual real people and that we can find them and reach them out across the web. Because if we don't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how cheap the audience segment is or how enormous it is when we start because we will not be able to drive the ultimate outcome. So the second case is also within health, but it's actually within retail and health. So the goal of this program was to reach people with chronic pain and drive them into a pharmacy to purchase OTC pain relievers. So here again, we worked with three third-party data providers. We used Philo and few segments of chronic pain conditions, purchasers of CBD, declared use of CBD for pain, purchasers of Advil and Aleve, interested in health and fitness, shop in big box retailers, and we targeted the movable middle. So those people, those consumers who we believed were persuadable to actually go to this pharmacy rather than those big box retailers. The Philo segments were the top performers for driving to store, and they drove a two times higher CTR, so I know, Christy, that that's not really that critical anymore. But in some <laughs> cases, it's important to understand engagement rates. And here again, we saw a better reach rate. But this time, the reach rate was across channels. So anybody that works across multiple channels knows it's really difficult to understand how you're reaching single consumers in audience pools across their mobile devices, their desktop devices, across OTT devices. So the fact that we were able to see such a high reach rate across multiple channels was a great statistic and showed that this program was successful on multiple levels. Awesome. So we have another retail case study. And this one was actually for a brick and mortar grocer who did not have um, an online process. And they're actually just going to market with trying to create a relationship through using like an online circular, very old school. but. They wanted to try to create some first party data. And so in this case, we actually used um, three, we used four different partners to test and understand. And I think this is where, if you, if you remember from Jeff's slide, I think it was 20, uh, the online, the grocery, the segment is 26% more likely to purchase at a grocery store. So kind of keying off that, we were looking for audiences to identify real people that were Mother's Day or Father's Day shoppers. Um, people that were pur past purchases of frozen foods, salty snacks. Um, and then ultimately, what we saw again was really positive performance from the, from the, the uh, Philo segments. And in this particular one, we saw a 91% plus video completion rate and then a 17% lower cost per action. So real people, real data driving real performance. And then um, our last case study, again, you know, using those infused segments, this is in the casual dining space. So a space where you know, we want to get online orders, we want to drive people to the store. And so we were able to actually target um, you know, an audience, an active, um, uh, expendable you know, uh, uh, audience that was able to actually, we were able to see use things like DoorDash or Uber Eats, Grubhub. And we were able to target people that said they get the munchies, right? So that, we know that could actually work really good in this space. And so um, when we ran those segments in DV360, we actually drove over 350,000 store visits and were able to actually lower our cost per visit by two times um, versus our benchmark. So you can see that these are complex programs. There are multiple KPIs in them. And we're using Philo in a way that allows us to reach real people and actually win. So for us, the bottom line for winning audience strategies are connecting with people based upon what matters most to them. And the way that we get there is by using great best-in-class data that informs, by operating in a way that's digitally responsible, by messaging people in a respectful, kind manner through conscious marketing, and defining and then delivering our outcomes. For the win, we thank you so much and we would be glad to take questions if we have time. Cool. By the way, amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more question, please. I thought that you had fired up some, uh, what some type of number, some debatable number, and stuff like that. 
The question was, just to, so everybody can hear, is there a threat, the, are privacy laws a threat to basically what we're doing with data today? And I would say that th things have changed and will continue to change as the laws go into effect. And if we get federal law, then certainly things will change. It's difficult to comply on a state by sta state level with all this different, with all these different laws. but. We will get there if we operate in these digitally responsible ways. If we analyze and look at partners and ensure that we're only working with data partners that follow those principles of ethically sourced data. And then if we're transparent with customers and we educate them about what we're doing with their data and why it's so valuable that Sean's receiving messaging about music and not about fabulous shoes, I think consumers will understand and want to to comply and and to and will appreciate the approach. I may add, um, I'm with sure. Action, so we are working with Philo. We are working with Philo, and, and we are about to launch a partnership. So sure. the Philo data will be available on the Axia marketplace as all the providers. Yeah, and I think the big thing there is the first party data, right? And so what Christiane is talking about is actually bringing those data segments into that addressable universe that we look at and. As all these regulations change, we're still advising marketers to make sure that you actually have as much first party data as possible so that as those regulations go in place, you're able to engage with the right audiences when you can. Um, and you know, like Nancy said, it's gonna constantly evolve, but we're confident that you know, as long as the data is right, the ownership, and you have those relationships with customers, we'll have a lot of opportunity to continue to be addressable. And we all operate in that way that's ethical and that's conscious, right? We can't just have pockets. We yeah. all have to operate in that way. Nancy, we have a question over here from Cattleman. Steve, here. Here's the mic. I just think it's worth noting that the, the, the type of quality the consent management companies are out there, what they've done over the past year is, yeah. is going to, I mean, that, that's helping a lot. Like, like when I was when I wore another hat at a, at a holding company, we were definitely purchasing. Uh, we were we were trying to run our brand's media that had a certain benchmark, and there was companies like SourcePoint and the like that yep. were saying, "Hey, this is a 90% uh, ethical way in which to yeah. receive consent from the consumer." So, I think it's I think that that type of business is is moving faster than than the legalities. Yeah. yeah. Aaron, did you have a question? I love what you were speaking about the first party data and the importance of that. I'm mm -hmm. curious what your strategy is in terms of curating custom audiences with data partners. Um, at Philo, we've you know, sourced and in-housed our data science team to really build out robust custom audiences and see our, our partners leveraging that. So curious how you're thinking about it on your side. Wanna start? Yeah, so um, we've actually at, at IPG had a, a long history of, of developing high value or growth audiences using real uh, data from Axiom. That was actually one of the reasons why IPG acquired Axiom. And so um, all of our um, efforts for clients actually start with marketing science, audience development, audience discovery. Um, and then really that flows th right through to, to the, the work that Nancy's team does in ensuring that we're able to activate th that activity. I, I'd just add something that you saw on the conscious marketing slide, which, is, which we are proponents of and which is a big part of building out those custom audiences for our brands, are audiences that are representative of the population. Yep. Because we have had brands who come to us and have specific audiences in mind that are not representative of the population of this country. And we believe that in order to be effective, we have to help our brands understand through insights what their data looks like in terms of comps against the population, and then with data that we have in-house from best-in-class providers and Axiom, build out those population representative audience segments. So. Um well, my name is Joe. Nice to meet you all. 
Um, so when I was approached by Philo um, at, when I was at Omnicom, the first thing that I thought of when I saw the data was healthcare, because yeah. cannabis is medicine. And so I'm really interested to, like, to hear your guys' point of view and how you talk about our data to your healthcare groups or you know, pharma, pharma clients, uh, and like what kind of uh, analogies do you use? Because um, I, I think that this is you know, healthcare data to a certain extent, and I wanted to you know, yeah. pick your guys' brain. Well, our, our pharma brands are interested in this type of data. So we have, for example, one brand that has an oncology drug that has many different indications. And for them, using this kind of data is really important and really critical to their programs and to driving success. Um, I think, putting me on the spot here, <laughs> Joe, but I think that we would, that we say that this is data that is ethically sourced and digitally responsible. It is cannabis data that comes from dispensaries and other places of that nature, and that this is a partner who has a taxonomy that allows us to be very specific in self-declared interest so that we can get really granular about the data that we're using and the audiences that we're building. Like the example that I showed of declared hypertension, I mean, that, that's, that's something that if people self-declare, we feel comfortable bringing to our brands and using. Yeah. But and I'll get back to my pitch. And it's a highly regulated space, Joe, as you know, and, and so a lot of times we do have to go through a, a lengthy process with the clients to ensure all those things. So that's, so our teams, you know, work closely to whenever we're recommending anything, we have to talk about where the data is coming from before we could even use it. Hey, Lewis, I'm going to give you the mic so everyone can hear it. Uh, going back to the prior topic, first-party data is really challenging for most CPGs because we don't have a direct relation with consumers for the majority of the business. And as you said, we need to be, uh, we need to talk to the overall population. We cannot hyper-segment or we're not going to have the reach we need. And the main concern is meanwhile we build the first-party data, which is always going to be a challenge of volume, quality, and how refresh, how much you need to refresh this data for a CPG. Uh, we spend a lot of time building a, a strong third-party data availability with many partners on a proper clean room, but the main concern is with regulations, maybe third-party data in the future, like Europe is getting more and more challenging. What we yeah. yep. do in the U.S. and Latin America, for example, we couldn't replicate in Europe uh, with uh, Axiom or yeah. other players in that landscape. And I'm a former Axiom uh, employee as well, so I know <laughs> the business quite well. <laughs> So the, 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 my, my main question is, do you see a real threat of not being able to provide this type of data? Because consumers understand, and wh whenever you explain <coughs> the importance, they, they are okay on yeah. sharing their data. That's why they were able to collect first party data in the first place. But regulators don't, right? Yeah. Usually they are much more uh, res restrict on what is gonna be possible. And the main concern is our business like Axiom Miracle apps on are going to be able to exist in the future because that can be a major, a big threat to whatever we want to do in that landscape. Yeah, I think all those companies will exist in the future, but um, and I'm not expert enough to speak to where those businesses will evolve. But I will say, as it relates to third party data, there's one new area of third party data for CBG brands that is gold, and that's the retail media network data. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And that's like the new gold. And I think that for CBGs, using data like that, philo data, this kind of data to run programs where you can drive people to a sign up page so that you can start building out, CBGs can start building out a first party database is the best way to go about that. Because of course, CBGs, every, every brand needs first party data. Because as consumers, we don't have a positive experience with a brand unless you identify us, unless you know us, and speak to us the way like you know us. Hold on, Chad. We're coming over with the mic. <laughs> Very hard to hear on the other side. It's a big room. Thanks, Jeff. I was saying, I think what you said is spot on. Like from a from the CPU side, they're all using 
Kroger or Albertsons or whoever is going to be giving them their uh, data because Kroger will go out to market and they sell their data as a standalone. I think for all, like I think they all use that CPG data. I think where Philo and this is not selling that we pitch Kroger is Kroger. You know that um, Ash is going to buy Frosted Flakes at Kroger, but now we can tell you that in Kroger in Cincinnati, Ohio, that you have um, a cannabis consumer that's going and buying cannabis at a Cincinnati dispensary. It's the one thing they don't have. So what we're trying to go, because they're all very protective over their data, yeah. what we're trying to do is, I think you said, is like get um, you, the retail data is very important, but layering on this other retail aspect of that consumer is kind of where we're really trying to push in the market today is going to Walmart and them and saying, you guys don't have this data access. How do you make, everyone uses, buys your data, Kroger, Walmart, they're all the same. What's a unique aspect you can bring um, from a retail perspective? So I yeah. think that's that's kind of what we're trying we're up against and we're trying to focus on right now and we agree and that's why I had in that slide that I did about data that informs that the data has to be infused with new attributes mm -hmm. and there have to be new combinations of data otherwise it's the same thing that everybody's been using for the last 10 years and it just won't be effective for the, the delivering the outcomes that we're all looking to deliver Awesome. Well, I think we're, we have a lot, that was a lot of questions, but great questions. I Good. think we're out of time. But uh, Nancy and Sean, thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.